Lighthouses have been used for thousands of years to guide mariners to safety. In prehistoric times, lighthouses were nothing more than fires built along the coast. Ireland has a long tradition of lighthouse building. This tradition goes way back to ancient times. When the Romans invaded Ireland, they built many lighthouses. But when the Roman Empire collapsed, these lights were extinguished and Europe was plunged into the blackness that became known as the Dark Ages. From this darkness emerged a glimmer of light, the light of Christianity. It is from this that the story of Irish lighthouses begins. The story begins with Hook Tower on the southeast coast of Ireland. Built 1,500 years ago by an ancient order of monks, the mysterious Hook Tower stands as a silent reminder to the ancient secrets that lie within. One small glimmer finds the sailor's eye. He peers ahead and gives a cry. Fear not! Dubbin has lit his light. We lose no lives on the rocks tonight. Uh, the practice of providing onshore beacons for uh, seafarers uh, and would date back to the, probably the dawn of Christianity in Ireland. A Welsh monk named Duvon came from Wales in um, 452. And um, I, I would assume that his brief was to save souls, but um, he probably ended up saving people as well because uh, he, he established a first light on the point here shortly after he arrived. And uh, there must have been, he must have seen a lot of tragedies and uh, bodies being washed up on the shoreline around the hook. And uh, he, what he actually had for a beacon was um, an iron basket raised on um, a mound of stones, which he would have lit every night. His followers then continued that practice until this present lighthouse was built by uh, William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, around about 1172. And he moved the monks from the local oratory, Dauphin's followers, into the uh, lighthouse here. And they continued on as light keepers until their reformation in uh, the mid 1500s. It was list listed as a fire tower. And um, uh, the fire would have been lit on top of uh, where the bottom balcony now, now is and then the, um, the top piece of the lighthouse was built in about 1780 that now houses the lantern. Today the light comes not from a fire but from the electric lantern. This particular optic was installed in 1864. At that time the light was powered by oil but was converted to electricity in 1972 but it is coal that was used for most of the tower's life. This room we're in now would have been um, a coal house uh, that would have uh, housed the coal for the fire. The monks also used the many trees that once lay around Hook Point. Uh, there's a local story told that the reason there's no trees on the Hook Peninsula is because um, the monks cut them all down to use in the fires uh, over the years and hence there's no there's no uh, trees whatsoever on the point here. The monks would also have used the wood for their kitchen because the tower was also their home. This is the uh, kitchen area of the, of the lighthouse and this is where the monks would have, would have um, cooked their meals. And as you can see, uh, it's, it would have been very basic. Now this is a 12th century fireplace, which is, I think there's only about two or three others in existence in Ireland. Um, they're, they're a very unique feature. And uh, the ceilings overhead, um, as you can see, they're, they're blackened from the coal fires over the years. Built around the edge of the tower were the monks' bedrooms. This is actually one of the cells where the monks would have slept. And um, as you can see from its size, it would have been impossible for someone to, um, to lie out here. So it was generally accepted in those days that um, you slept in a chair in a reclining position because of the uh, danger of choking if you lay down. When they uh, disappeared from the scene around the middle of the 1500s, uh, it is said that the place then um, fell into disrepair into the early 1700s when it was relit. 
and uh, it has been has continued on um, uninterrupted since. I was born just down the road here, um, about a quarter of a mile from the lighthouse, um, almost next door to Duvon's uh, monastery. And I often think it's probably slightly ironic that he was the first keeper here in 452 and I was the last in um, 1996. And um, I would have gone to school with, with, uh, with the families of many light keepers who would have been stationed here. As you grew up here, you couldn't help but be um, dominated by this massive black and white building here on the end of the point. As well as being a lighthouse and the monks' home, it was also their place of worship. In contrast to their harsh bedrooms, the chapel was the largest and most pleasant of all the chambers in the tower. But at night, the tower becomes a different place. Walking through the tower, one cannot help but think that the monks are never far away. For various reasons, I've had to come up to the lighthouse here at night time for um, either maintenance work or some other reason. And uh, after dark, the whole building takes on a, a new feeling. And um, as you pass the monk's cells, you, you, you can sort of get a feeling of a, some roped figure standing there. And uh, it's, it's a, I have to say, it's an unsettling feeling and you don't dodge around here too long. Now this is the chapel. And this is the room that allegedly houses our resident ghosts. Uh, for many years, people coming up and down the steps, especially at night time, of course, would have heard um, steps either preceding them up or following them up, this, uh, up the stairway. Um, only about two years ago, an eminent uh, medical gentleman um, alleges he saw two ghosts just in the windy area over here. And he actually sketched the two apparitions. And he described them, um, one a young man with an old man's face, and the other a very haggard looking gentleman. Outside the tower next to the sea walls are the graves of the monks. Standing in this graveyard, one can look up and see an unusually shaped wall on the outside of the tower. This is the secret room. This room is visible on the outside, but nobody knows how to get in. What is inside, nobody knows, except the monks who built it. Buried under the tiny pebbles of the graveyard lie the bodies of St. Dublin's followers. They're down there, not far away, their secrets buried with them. In times gone by, life for the keepers was very hard indeed. The cold, the damp, the isolation, working throughout the night in all weathers. The light must shine come rain, fog, snow or hurricane. Life would have been hard enough on the offshore lighthouses, but the men who manned the light vessels had to endure dreadful hardship and great danger. A light vessel was simply a ship that had a small tower upon it that housed the lantern. Life on board one of these vessels was terrible. The living conditions were pretty appalling in a, a light ship. You obviously had to stay there and live on the ship in, in all weathers. And it, the, the ship was moored uh, both fore and aft so that when a sea hit it sideways on, you had a terrible rolling effect. It wasn't like a ship that was moored just at one end. Uh, the, 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 the waves just knocked it backwards and forwards. The fact that the light ship was moored at both ends meant that the ship could not go anywhere. There was no engine aboard, only a generator to power the light. The cables and the anchors that held the light vessel in place had to be immensely strong to stop the ship being dashed against the rocks and heavy seas. There was a system called inspecting cable. Now a light ship's cable, as you can appreciate, was strung out all the time and it was a very solid cable. 
it was a studded link cable. Of course there was no motive power on light ships. Uh, they could not move themselves, they had to be towed wherever they were to go. In addition to putting up with all the hardships, the crew had also to contend with very cramped living conditions. The conditions on board a light ship were probably worse than any seagoing vessel. Here they would stay for 28 days at a time before they were relieved of duty by the next crew. After 14 days at home with their family, it would be their turn to go back out and man the ships once more. Getting men and supplies on and off a light vessel was a very hazardous operation. In good weather, the crew were taken off in a small boat, but in bad weather, a rather more drastic method was required. The crew and supplies would have to be winched across a lifeline attached to both ships. Often, both men and equipment were drenched by the time they were landed on board the light ship. Just outside the entrance to Cork Harbour is a small yet very dangerous rock. This rock was guarded by a lightship called the Daunt. What happened to that ship on a stormy November night in 1936 is a maritime legend, a story of suffering, endurance and bravery. During one of the worst storms in living memory, the Daunt's moorings broke and the ship began to drift hopelessly out of control towards the much-feared Roberts Cove. On Friday last, strong easterly winds arose with seas mountainous high and by Sunday this had developed into a hurricane. Time and time again the seas dashed over us, drenching us to the skin and tossing our craft hither and thither as if it had been a cork. On Monday night the wind went mad in its fury. The seas continually pounded us and indeed it looked as though we were lost. At one o'clock Tuesday morning, our cable of which we had about 190 fathoms parted and we were being blown towards those hated rocks of Robert's Cove. We worked like demons to run to our second cable. Our first attempt was a failure. We made another attempt. Those 20 minutes that it took us to run out our second cable seemed like an eternity. You can guess the joy we experienced as we felt the anchor grip the bottom and check our progress to destruction. However, from then on, it was a marathon struggle to prevent the ship being dashed on the rocks. For seven long days and nights, the crew worked to make sure that the ship did not drift again. For those seven days, they had neither food nor sleep. The Ballycotton lifeboat was summoned and attempted to get alongside. For three days, it stood by the Daunt, the longest time ever in the service's history. The rescuing of the Dawn's crew required the greatest degree of seamanship. Five times the lifeboat attempted to draw alongside, until on the sixth, it succeeded. All of the men on board were saved. To the heroic men of the Dawn who continued to do their duty despite staring death in the face, and to the gallant crew of the lifeboat who finally rescued them, Tributes poured in from their fellows and their countrymen in what is one of Ireland's greatest maritime stories. The heroism of the Ballycotton lifeboat's rescue of the Daunt left an indelible mark upon the pretty village of Ballycotton. Just a short walk from the memorial plaque, there is the lifeboat station looking out over the tranquil Ballycotton harbour. It's hard to believe how this placid water can become a ferocious and unforgiving sea. Watching over this scene is a black sentinel, the Ballycotton Lighthouse. It was painted black in 1902 so that it was not mistaken for the nearby Capel Island when mariners saw the towers in the daytime. The tower was built by George Halpin and the light first shone from the black tower in 1851. Visible for 18 miles, the light of Ballycotton would have been a welcome sight for a mariner in those days, knowing that there was a light to guide them and someone to watch out for them. In days gone by, the keepers arrived at the island by boat. There are several landings around the island, so if the waves were bad on one side of the island, then hopefully a safe landing could be found on the other side. 
For over a hundred years, dozens of keepers would have climbed the many steps of Ballycotton. Even though this is still quite a walk, it is almost luxurious compared to other offshore lighthouses. For the men who looked after the mariners in the area, Ballycotton was a very popular place to live and work. Many of the keepers remember with great affection their time spent on Ballycotton. We were actually living in Ballycotton and we knew all the fishermen in the small boats and they were fishing around the lighthouse in Ballycotton. We kept a very close eye on them. I was stationed in Ballycotton for some time. I knew the guys, I knew their boats and they felt as well that we were looking after them. I was on, I was on Ballycotton, yeah, Ballycotton Lighthouse, which is, um, it's, although being a rock station, it's only, if you want, a stone's throw from the shore, because when you're beyond there at night, you could, you could hear the people ashore, you could nearly hear the glasses tinkling in the local pubs, <laughs> so, so you were kind of, you, you were close to shore, yet you were, you were remote, you, had, you were out on the rock, and that was it, even though you were only a couple of hundred yards off the shore. Ballycotton was a particularly, a particularly nice place. It was, it was so different from so many others. We had an island. We had goats, which were milked twice a day. We had chickens. We had vegetable gardens. We fished. We swam. It was idyllic. It really was, as as these places go. Ballycotton may have been a popular place for the keepers today, but it was not always the case. Well, in the olden days, as I say, um, the, uh, the building wasn't great and, uh, and keepers and workmen uh, uh, lived under the one roof, but then in the, in the 70s they built this Ballycotton Hilton and of course it is really a, a beautiful structure and uh, but uh, you literally had everything. You had really uh, great comfort here then. The Ballycotton Hilton was a modern building and as such the keepers had many modern facilities. It was important that the kitchen was well equipped as it was one of the most important places on the island, especially with the rich variety of food that is on Ballycotton. Unusually, for an offshore lighthouse, food was never scarce here. We all, all keepers had their own gardens. They, they planted their own potatoes, vegetables, lettuce, and, and we had hens, of course, and we had uh, our own supply of eggs and goat's milk. Uh, we had a goat farm here, and um, uh, in the olden days, uh, all the keepers uh, took a great interest in the goats, and um, they were well cared for, and we had uh, plenty of milk, plenty of eggs, plenty of vegetables. So. Um, we, it kept keepers occupied and, and then having uh, fresh vegetables close at hand, it, it was very important. We had a, a pet goat here actually and he was very fond of uh, smoking uh, cigarettes and he loved the cigarettes. He would put a lighted cigarette in, in his mouth and he would uh, suck away it and he'd lo love it and there was smoke coming out all angles. The billy coats were really a bit wild and uh, we used to um, deport uh, the billy goats uh, to the middle island in the, in this, in the, in the mating season because uh, every year there would be um, new kids born and uh, young billies and uh, we normally got a, a fresh billy off every year so as uh, the, to prevent uh, close breeding and uh, it was a problem uh, catching the, uh, the young billies to uh, deport them over to the middle island. We had many chases and they often went into the sea to, to avoid being caught and uh, on one occasion one day we'd, we'd rounded up a, a, a billy and rather than being caught he jumped into the sea and he swam out to sea and as, as he was going out he went down deeper in the water and he was about to, to drown and uh, a local fishing boat came uh, to his rescue and brought him into the landing and uh, we captured him there then and uh, we kept him until the next boat took him to the middle island. So that's, this, that's where he stayed for the rest of his life. Life in Ballycotton was not all about farming. There was still a job to do. The life of a keeper was one of hard work. His main duty was to attend to the light, but he had plenty of other things to do as well. Every few hours he would have to check and keep a record of the weather. During daylight hours, the keepers would spend their time cleaning the light and carrying out the maintenance work. In addition to all of this, 
a lighthouse keeper is duty bound to keep a lookout for all passing vessels. While I was here at Ballycotton then, um, a motor launch uh, from England uh, was coming across to Ireland. Uh, just a family, a husband, a wife and a few children. And uh, one morning I just came on watch here at uh, quarter past ten in the morning and I heard this mayday call. So uh, I heard nobody answering it so I um, uh, replied to the mayday call and uh, the, the people on board were really in a panic situation and they were really thrilled to, to hear a person uh, uh, replying to them. So uh, they thought they were on the Wexford coast but I, knowing, uh, having listened to their transmission, I knew uh, we wouldn't be able to pick up uh, any transmission on the Wexford coast. So um, I told them they had to be in the Cork coast. So I said, you can't be too far away from Ballycotton. So anyway, while talking to them and cooling them down, um, our own Navy ship was coming out from Cork Harbour and the captain heard me and he said uh, he would be able to uh, pinpoint the uh, actual uh, signal when, when he got outside the uh, Roaches Point. So with his directional fine equipment, he, uh, he was about half a mile outside Roaches Point and he uh, was able to pinpoint uh, where they actually were. So they steamed to the casualty and picked them up and brought them back into uh, Cork. Only the goats still occupy Ballycotton. They have outlasted the men who brought them here. Even the retired billy goats continue to live upon the small island, still looking out over the water at their former home. For them, like the keepers of Ballycotton, their day is done. After a hundred years of service, Ballycotton is no longer occupied. Anthony Burke closes the gates as he has done many times over the years, but this time is his last. I was the last keeper to, uh, to close Ballycotton, the last, very last. Uh, I had been the last keeper uh, for the last six closures, so uh, people don't like me coming to the station because they feel, well, it's the end when they see me coming. He leaves a lighthouse that is automatic and computer controlled. The mariners in Ballycotton now look upon the Ballycotton Tower, tall, imposing and deserted. Departing for the last time, he sails away, leaving behind him a proud and noble heritage. Lighthouses come in all shapes and sizes, but we cannot escape our imagination of what we think they should be like. If someone asked you to sit and draw a lighthouse, you would draw majestic towers sitting on a tiny island of jagged rocks surrounded by huge crashing waves. For once, the reality matches and exceeds the fantasy. The lighthouse of our imagination really does exist. It is called the Fastnet. The lighthouse we see today is the second Fastnet lighthouse. The light shone for the first time on the Fastnet rock in 1854. But a mere 30 years later, it had to be rebuilt in case it suffered the same fate as the Calf Rock. They were afraid of, 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 of the old lighthouse due to the fact that um, the Calf Rock, which is off Dorsey Head, was constructed on the same principles with a cast iron up of one third of its height and from there up was masonry. So they were afraid of the fastener one in case it might um, crack in the same place. So they decided to uh, survey the rock for a new lighthouse. In 1892, preparations began to build a new lighthouse. It was designed by William Douglas, who proposed to build a tower over 50 feet wide and almost 180 feet high. After four years of preparation, work began. It was one thing designing this on paper, but to actually build it was another matter. The remarkable man with this responsibility was called James Kavanagh. 
For seven years, teams of 22 men lived and worked on the Fastnet Rock. They would often stay there for three months at a time, working in one of the most unpleasant and frightening environments. Each man was lashed by a rope, so when one of the huge waves washed over the rock, he was not washed away with it. It was, it was appalling really because they had to sleep in very uh, enclosed spaces and um, apparently they had to be up in the morning about half past five to air their clothing and whatever they had to eat, they had to eat and they walked at the lighthouse, at the tower until uh, the sun went down in the evening. And this was continued all through the summer months until about uh, September where they closed off the structure against uh, the winter gates. Yeah, they lived in, in the old lighthouse itself, the old uh, cast iron structure. It was there that they, they lived um, before the, uh, the new uh, fastnet was built. The stump is what remains of the old lighthouse. After the new fastnet was built, it was eventually dismantled brick by brick, leaving the cast iron base. My grandfather was both on, on, the, on the old Ierne, which was specially built to land the granite blocks for the Fastnet Lighthouse. And over the uh, four year period in construction, uh, it was both on the Ierne, which brought the granite blocks from Rock Island out to the Fastnet. And uh, from the Ierne to the, to the Fastnet, it was landed by Breaches By. A main hawser that stretched from uh, the ship onto the rock where they slung the granite blocks onto this hawser and pulled to shore. And uh, from uh, the pier heading on the fast that they brought the granite blocks by a small railway track onto the base. Apparently the, the heaviest block is five ton and the lightest block is one ton weight. Yeah, the blocks uh, came from Cornwall, and apparently it was Cornish uh, quarrymen that uh, cut out the foundation for the actual tower itself. There are over 2,000 granite blocks in the tower, weighing a total of 4,300 tons. All fitting perfectly and sealed with lead, it is an amazing example of masonry. The, uh, the construction is, in a sense, um, all dovetailed together and, and dowled and grooved. Um, apparently there was only one block they had to make specially. The one block was lost or broke. So they had to make one block specially for the structure. The tower was completed in 1903. The final task was to install the lamp. The lantern was landed and stored out of reach of the stormy waters below. However, that night, a particularly savage storm descended on the fastnet and destroyed the lantern. As a new lamp could not be built straight away, the lantern from Halpin's old lighthouse was used for the first year. Sadly, James Kavanagh never lived to see the light established. Near the end of the construction, he complained of feeling ill and was taken ashore. Tragically, he died of a stroke before the new light was lit. Life on the Fastnet could be a truly frightening experience. In the winter time, the power of the sea was such that no one dared venture out of the tower. Uh, you have literally mountainous waves on the Fastnet. I think it's the uh, I never experienced waves like it uh, anywhere in any, uh, in any other station around the coast. The Fastnet is the worst place on the coast and you really get mountainous seas and uh, you daren't put your nose outside the place. Everything, uh, windows, doors, in a storm situation, uh, everything has to be locked up and keepers just have to remain indoors. No matter what happens outside, you just daren't go out because if you did go out, well, the place would be flooded or you'd be blown away. It was a frightening, sta a frightening uh, light. It was one lighthouse that you would really be frightened uh, uh, on it. And in the winter time, it was a very frightening situation. And um, I nearly lost my life on the fast. I was 
Uh, all the mechanism was really inside in the tower of the fastener, but uh, you had to go out to um, the aisle store and uh, one day the, the sea was getting up, so um, I was a wee bit late in going out and I went out and I went and closed the actual aisle store doors and uh, I had that done and I was just about to return to the tower and a sea came over the, um, the, the entire tower and uh, came gushing down the steps and of course they took the two legs from under me and I was lucky on that occasion, I grabbed an eye bolt other than that, I would have been gone. There were also stations which a number of lads dreaded going to. And again, my own particular one is, and thanks to God, it was only a fortnight on it, that was the fastness rock which is again down off, uh, so off Cork. And it was just a, a small rock and a tower directly up, into, up off the rock. So when you got on, you had to get off the helipad quick and get up into the tower because seas, when the seas got up, they could wash right over the, the rock altogether. In very bad stormy weather, the tower actually swayed. It used to sway three feet either side of center at the very top of the light. So it'd be a certain, chap, you know, he'd want me to put up with that and a lot of lads could lose their nerve with it. You'll be on the fastener there, the, the table was built around the weight trunk and uh, when a sea would hit it, it would shake and the teacup would fall off the table quite often. Um, the fastener, it was, it was unusual because you had to, um, you had to live and cope in the actual tower itself and, and comparing to other stations where you had a dwelling, something similar to your own place at home. Uh, you had to actually live and sleep in the tower itself. You could run with bad weather maybe for, maybe for two or three weeks before you get any supply, so you have to depend on the, the provisions that were, that were there, you know, the, the, the stuff that was left in the, the lighthouse. Yeah, I remember on several occasions where the ship was only just about 10 minutes off the rock and we lost the landing, the sea got very rough and uh, we were unable to carry out the relief, resulting then of, of all the fellas coming back up again and making their beds and starting to cook and putting a cake together and hoping then within the next maybe fortnight we'll get to relief again, you know. So you had, you had a great um, comradeship with the people that's on here, you know, you had tremendous characters so they all got on pretty well together at that time you would go out for you were supposed to have a boat every two weeks but that could run on to three weeks or four weeks so you had to provide for that time food wise but uh, this keeper he only took enough out for 10 days and at the end of the Ten days he had nothing, so he started pilfering and uh, taking other men's flour. So one of the keepers says, uh, I'll have to do something about that. And he got white cement and mixed it with the flour. Your man baked a cake that day. When he took it out of the oven, if he had enough of them, he could have built ten lighthouses. <laughs> a good sense of humour certainly helped as the three keepers would be locked up together for weeks on end during the winter. During this time, the keepers would lock the doors at the base of the lighthouse, each door weighing half a ton. One ton of metal separating them from the terrifying power of the sea. Here they would stay for however long it took the storm to blow over. They would be locked up for weeks at a time in a tower full of noise and engine fumes, surrounded by 100-foot waves hitting the side of the tower. You're, um, you're as we call it, you're battened down for, for, for stormy weather, you know. And um, it can, of course, be frightening, you know, like the whole actual tower shakes with, with the weight of the sea hitting the tower. When the sea go across, you can feel your, your, your rib case practically collapsing with, with, with the pressure of the sea and both the pressure of the air on your body. So it was a 
frightening experience. Off duty, the keepers would have had little to do but to wait patiently for the storm to blow over. In effect, they were prisoners of the sea, helpless, waiting for their time to be set free once again. Uh, my, my most uh, frightening experience was 1985, when a very heavy sea hit the tow here. And it oscillated the lint so violently that um, we lost about two pints of mercury. And the uh, mercury cascaded right down along the iron steps. And um, we had to try to maintain the light because um, even the heavy spray was coming through the, the, the actual dome, which is approximately 180 feet over high water. The storms would eventually end and the keepers could begin to think about their freedom and going home. During the days of the immigration, the ships that sailed to America traveled past the Fastnet and it became known as the Teardrop of Ireland because for many, it would be their last sight of Ireland. For some, it would be their last sight of land ever. It was also given this name because the Fastnet would be the first site of Ireland should any of the immigrants ever return to their homeland. In future years, if any of the immigrants manage to return to Ireland by boat, they may not see the Fastnet at all. There is a deep crack running through the rock and one day the sea will eventually overcome this greatest of all lighthouses and will crash into the sea. One hundred 200 years time, nobody knows when it will fall. But one thing is for sure, the end of the Fastnet will be as memorable as its beginnings. The story of the Bull and Calf Rock is perhaps the best and most well-known example of when the power of the sea proves to be too strong. These two rocks are only a couple of miles apart, yet they are two very different islands. Well, originally when they thought about building a lighthouse in this area, the survey was done in well, the late 1840s. And they decided that they would put one here and on the Foes Rock. Despite the valiant attempts of designers and engineers, the power of the sea is a force that cannot be beaten, only contained. Yeah, they surveyed all the area and the original recommendation was to put one here. And um, for some reason then they changed their mind and they put one on the calf, on the calf rock. They were putting up cast iron lighthouses and the, the actual structure of them. So I suppose to get one up here would have been quite something and to put one there I suppose seemed relatively easy. In the winter of 1881, a terrible storm raged across the southwest of Ireland. That night, the principal keeper was lying in bed when he heard a huge crash from the lantern above him. He thought the glass had broken and rushed upstairs to see if he could repair the glass. He was astonished to find that the first thing he saw was not the lantern, it was the sky. Um, it cracked off with the where the reinforced bit met the, met the original tower. The following morning, the local villagers looked out across the water. They were shocked at the sight of the ruined tower. The men's devastated families assumed the worst and mourned their loss. There were six men on, on the rock, three keepers and um, three tradesmen that happened to be out there. And, um, Bad storm, and it just it just uh, cracked off. They were lucky to escape. The six of them survived. They were trapped on the rock for about two weeks. After that, before they before they could get them off it, they managed to um, float in supplies and and water and that to them. And the men took uh, shelter in in an outside store. So they were um, very very lucky. The place itself is. Um, is often covered by sea when we're watching it here in uh, really bad days. You know, you'd you'd wonder how they how they did survive. So um, they then started on on building building this place, and of course they had to land here and start quarrying the stone here. There weren't uh, 
They didn't bring out a, a lot of stone, they quarried it up, and, up in the field. The lighthouse and other buildings are made almost entirely from the stone of the island itself. It was very resourceful of the men to use the existing materials on the island as it saved them a great deal of time trying to land all the stonework on the island. Today, landing supplies and materials on Bull Rock does not seem a problem, especially with the use of helicopters. But just a few hundred yards away are the old and abandoned Derrick Cranes, a reminder of just how difficult getting things on and off Bull Rock must have been. At almost 200 feet above the water, it was just not possible to build a crane in those days to reach that far down. They needed an alternative way of carrying out the lifts. The solution they came up with was to do it in three stages. The supply ship would try and take shelter in the cove and the equipment would be lifted by the first crane and landed on shore. Then it would be lifted by the second crane onto the old gas station roof and finally once more up to the lighthouse. It was a race against time to complete this job as the weather could turn at any moment and the supply ship would have no choice but to leave. Needless to say, all the men were exhausted after this. Getting men on and off here was done in one easy, simple, yet terrifying lift. The step out landing was something that only happened maybe once or twice a year, so you were literally fished out of the boat by what you could describe as a joint fishing rod. It was a derrick and a winch and a bosun's chair that was lowered down into the boat. You were um, winched out of the boat because of the backwash from the rock itself. The, the boat couldn't come in alongside. And often, um, if the guys on the winch weren't fast enough taking you up, the sea would come up behind you and completely engulf you. But you just held on and landed like a drowned rat usually on, on, on the rock. The places by the nature are, are, are dangerous, um, you know, there are headlands on top of cliffs out on lumps of rock somewhere. And this one, the, the same as any other. Um, Eugene O'Sullivan was lost here in, in 1917, I think it was. Um, went down fishing and, and never came back. My grandfather was at the Bull Rock and uh, he was drowned there, he went fishing and uh, that was the end of him. His body was never discovered. I did a month on the Bull Rock when I was supernumerary, but I never liked it because it brought back old memories to me. It was the place that my grandfather was drowned at, so I was glad the day I went ashore from it. And the man, a Jack Kavanagh, he was the son of James Kavanagh. He would have been the main stonemason on the fastnet, on the building of that. He died out here in, uh, I think it was 1938. The bull rock may have been dangerous for men, but for the birds it was paradise. There is a huge colony of gannets here, as well as kittiwakes, puffins, razorbills, fulmers, and black-backed gulls. A huge variety of life on what appears to be a desolate rock. And you miss them when they go. Uh, might complain about them at times, but uh, it's, a, it's a very quiet place without them. The keepers on Bull Rock are never allowed to forget what happened on the Calf Rock. The same storms that destroyed the Calf still rage about the Bull Rock today, serving as a constant reminder of the power of the sea. Yes, it was particularly bad and I don't know how the wind had got in under the slate, 
what it had. And we saw some slates uh, disappearing. And uh, we decided to go up to the lantern to, to have a look. And uh, up to the lantern we went, three of us of course, and, uh, and it was amazing just to see the, the wind getting in under the roof at one end and it went down it like a, a ripple and uh, a load of slates would fly and then another gust would get it and another load of slates would fly and it was quite something to be up there and watch a, watch a roof being stripped. Um, Force 11, I don't think I'd like to be stuck in a whole lot more than that. It's like being on all of them. They've all stood up so well to to time here, the Fastnet, the Skelligs, the Tears, and all the Southwest Coast ones. And I suppose you can feel comfortable. You can you can be in bed and hear it pounding, and and you know you you do feel safe enough. The disaster of Calf Rock was a hard lesson for the service, but much was learned from it. To their credit, the commissioners of Irish Lights acted very quickly to make sure that this never happened again. Despite the awesome forces that are unleashed on these buildings, they are still here, standing as a testament to the skill and the bravery of the men who built them. Across the glistening waters, across the wild open seas, towards the rocky island, that is the place of dreams. Away from all we know of, away from the truth of life, I come to the Isle of Mystery that lives on for all time. The moment lives forever, the memories never die, and now at last when I touch it, I know I will feel it the rest of my life. In no place does the connection between Ireland's past and present exist so clearly as the rocky, isolated islands known as the Skellig Rocks. Some eight and a half miles off the southwest coast, they consist of Skellig Michael, or Greater Skellig, and Little Skellig nestling just across the water, covered as it almost always is with thousands of birds. And indeed, birds seem the only logical inhabitants of such barren, inhospitable pieces of land. Majestic in their own brutal, jagged formation, even Skellig Michael would never be a voluntary place for a person to live. And yet, over 1,300 years ago, that is exactly what a group of monks did. Well, I suppose the story of the Skellig starts about the 6th century, when the monks came out and they built a monastery. Uh, that was quite an achievement, considering that, that their average height was about five foot three, and their average lifespan was about 40 years. And the monks at, at different stages stayed here for over 600 years. They left on or about the 12th century. Very little is known about them, really. They, they were mentioned in the end of the Four Masters, where, where the abbot, Ergol, was, was uh, captured by the Vikings and uh, starved to death. Sometime around the 12th century, they moved into Balanskelligs, which is on the mainland. So they, they moved back in there at that stage. They built three flights of stairs, one facing north, one facing south, and one facing east, which means, of course, that they intended being here in all weather, and allowing them landing sites, no matter what direction the Atlantic was coming from. Since nothing is really known of the monks' life, nothing is similarly known of how they survived. In summer, the bird life and fish might have sustained a diet, but in winter, it would surely have become much more difficult. This lack of recorded fact feeds many of the mysteries that envelop the Schkelligs, not least the astounding feat of how the monks actually built the settlement. Nestling 500 feet above sea level, the six beehive cells and two oratories rest on a narrow saddle of land that even in our modern world would be a major feat of planning and construction. By the 16th century, the Schkelligs was listed as a popular destination for pilgrimages. The pilgrims undergoing a hazardous climb through wild valleys and up steep cliffs to the Stations of the Cross where they kissed a rock by the Needle Eye. I enjoyed 
enjoyed my time very much on the Skelligs. It's, uh, it's a very unique spot. Um, each individual could build up their own history and their feelings about the place. Inevitably, the oldest inhabitants of Skellig Michael are the ghosts of the monks. Indeed, many lighthouse keepers have reported shadowy figures and strange apparitions flitting in and out of the dark. Though sometimes this gave an excuse for some practical jokes. One particular keeper used to dress up in the, the garments of the, of the old monks there. And uh, apparently one particular night when the, all the young lads went for a walk right down to the very landing of the Skelligs, the sole keeper dressed up, of course, in his garments, and he um, waited for the, the young lads to come up around the, the bend, and he started to uh, recite parts of the Mass in Latin. To their consternation, of course, they, they, they got it. an enormous fright, of course, but uh, the, old, the old keeper, of course, was, was so far ahead of them anyway, he got, he got into the dwellings when they busted in and told the course of their, what they heard and what they saw. Apart from the monks, the longest human inhabitants have been the keepers and their families who were sent to this rocky outpost to safeguard the boats sailing by the Kerry coast. The two lighthouses are some 400 feet apart and their lights first shone across the waters over 170 years ago. The, the Knight of Kerry, who was a local landlord on Valencia, requested that the Dublin Ballast Board build the lighthouse on the Skelligs and he, they finally gave permission in, in 1820 to commence work and they engaged an engineer called Halpin and he designed the, the, the two lighthouses that, are, that we are on and the roadway to the lighthouses. Um, at that time navigation was extremely poor of course and to distinguish the Skelligs from Loop Head they built two lighthouses on, on the Skelligs because at the time it was fixed lights, not a flashing light. If you look around you it's just quite an achievement in the building of it and the families lived here. There was two families living here and two families on the lower lighthouse. On or about 1870, they opened the lighthouse on an inch tier it, and they extinguished this lighthouse. The reason for there originally being two lighthouses was because there were fixed lights at the time, no ability for flashing that distinguishes them in the modern age. Two separate lights meant that a ship could place where they were but it also meant that four families were stationed here for months at a time. We can only imagine what it was like to actually live as a family on this remote island, high up on the hill. Often beaten down by the storms that encircle the Skelligs, they would be without contact with the mainland for weeks on end and literally trapped inside the buildings. From the drafty, broken remnants that are now left, it is all the more remarkable how the monks built huts that have weathered the years so much better. On calm, sunny days, it is hard to grasp the dangers that are everywhere. And yet the Skelligs have a long, tragic history for the keepers and the families that lived here. From 1826 onwards, two families lived in the dwellings here. They continued to live there up to about 1901. Um, not without tragedy over that period of time. The records show that a man by the name of Redmond lost his two sons and a nephew. They obviously fell over the cliff. Another family by the name of Callahan's. Two of his children are buried in the monastery. Uh, no one knows what they died of. He subsequently was transferred to Inishowen East Lighthouse and five more of his children died there. Uh, nobody knows where they died from except that they're, they're buried in, 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 in the Inishowen Peninsula. Just a simple glance at the precipitous drops can explain the dangers that lie in store with just one wrong step. A keeper named Michael Wishart was particularly unlucky. Originally a keeper on the Tuscar, one day he found some barrels of liquor washed ashore and, having indulged more than he should have, failed to light the light. He was subsequently demoted to the Skelligs and, whilst cutting grass for his cow, fell to his death off the edge of the cliff. 
Unsurprisingly, nobody kept a cow on the Schelligs again. And whether it be windy or calm, care always has to be taken, especially on some of the steep climbs. I think that the, la the last tragedy on, on the Skelligs was uh, a lightkeeper by the name of Seamus Rohew. He was here in 1956 and prepared his lunch, beautiful August day, and went for a walk down towards the boat landing. I was never again seen. Obviously, he, he fell over the cliff. Or he disappeared off the rock in any case, and no trace was ever again found. He left a wife and two children after him. If humans were in danger from living at the Schelligs, then the waters that surround them are of even greater danger to those that sail past. The rocks hidden just beneath the surface are a testament to the importance of the lighthouse, though not even that could help the Lady Nelson sinking with the loss of all but three of her crew. They only managed to survive by clinging to rocks and periodically swimming out to retrieve fruit that had formed the cargo they had been carrying. Incredibly, they lived like this for over three days before being spotted and rescued by a fishing boat. Even as late as 1995, the 90-ton French trawler Stoyle ran headlong into the rocks and had to be towed to the nearest harbour, though thankfully on this occasion no lives were lost. Well, of course, this is one of the better ones, you know, there's plenty of room to walk around and if you weren't talking to your, your neighbours, you could always go for a stroll. If you felt like going praying, you could go to the monastery. There were several places you could go. And, and of course, this time of the year is fantastic for bird life. You know, all different types of birds here, nesting and breeding. From Kitty Wakes to Fullmans, from Guillemots to Puffins, the Schelligs are literally covered with bird life. And nowhere is this better seen than on Little Schelligs, a jagged outcrop stranded in the middle of the water that has become virtually the sole preserve of gannets, making it look like a living, breathing piece of rock. The bird life has now reclaimed this rocky outpost. The automated lighthouse is a permanent reminder of modern man's brief adventure living on nature's wild creation. Now all that truly remains are the memories and the stories, the physical remnants of the buildings and the ghosts that will forever roam its shores. If the Schelligs literally echo with the spirits of the past, then Tory Island feels like a place where time has stood still. Hemmed in by the sea, this dark, eerie land exudes a sense of danger and foreboding. The lighthouse is one of the main markers of the northwest corner of Ireland's rugged coast. 140 feet above sea level, it proudly surveys the seas. Keepers who came to the island were stationed at the west end, away from the villages. But life there was not too lonely for them, and the locals were welcoming. Originally, the light was fueled by oil lamps and reflectors were used to exaggerate the brightness. Then came the innovation to make the light revolve and so other fuel sources were tried. In 1887, coal gas and from 1923 to 1972, vaporized paraffin. Not until 1972 was electricity used. The island is a little more than two and a half miles long and at its greatest a mere half a mile wide, 
The most striking feature is the rocky, angry landscape that is more in common with the endless, flat horizons of a Martian world than what we think of as a lush Irish countryside. Tory takes its name from the high cliffs on its western side that over the years have been eroded into fantastic pillars or tors, and the lighthouse stands alone amongst them, warning passing vessels of the dangers they hold. Tory Island, uh, I was there for seven years. It was a very rugged island, not fertile at all. Uh, the people were a bit uh, backward. They didn't like to talk to you at all in the beginning. But once they got to know you, they were okay. And uh, I had a great time there too, on Tory. There's about a uh, hundred people on Tory, a hundred inhabitants. They have a ho hotel now there at the moment. And uh, fishing, and uh, that would be their main uh, income for the inhabitants now in Tory. Well, I wouldn't think they're independent from the rest of Ireland because they're depending on uh, <laughs> on the government, government to keep them going, you know. They, they like to think they're independent, but they're, they're really not. <laughs> no, no way. I was on Torrey again, uh, which is... Uh, it was a, a fine station, you had the local inhabitants on Torrey. And fine people, fine, again, Gaelic-speaking people. And a different, a different dialect now to the some of the lads that I worked with from the west of Ireland, the Aran Islands, that now, a different dialect of Irish, you know, it was far quicker. And even some of the lads from Aran Islands wouldn't understand the Irish from, from Tory. That was a fine place to be. And as I say, you had, there was a local she being, as you say, on the island there, that if you did want to, the odd point, you could go down. You know, off your watch there, you go down and have a point or two and a bit of a laugh at the locals and that. So it's a good spot. The islanders have a hard life, the soil being literally too thin to work, and they find themselves dependent on social welfare to exist. Not to be dispirited by this, they try to make the most of whatever should come their way. After a violent storm, they scour the shores looking for useful wreckage, bits of timber or fragments of metal, that they can perhaps turn into tools or just use as firewood. And they are canny folk, often turning misfortune to good use. The, there was an elephant washed ashore on Torrey Island, and it's believed it came from a circus. The story went that it came ashore live, and uh, someone went to the priest's house, and they said, Father, there's an animal in my garden and it's pulling the cabbages up with its tail, and you wouldn't guess where it's pushing them. But I, I think the real story was the elephant came in dead, <laughs> and uh, it was lying on the beach, creating quite a bit of a smell. And uh, there was cement sent out for the islanders to make a grave for it. So every house on the island was cemented, new cement, and the poor old elephant <laughs> was never covered up. <laughs> he wasted away, he was lying on the beach for months. <laughs> so that's the, the story I heard about the elephant. Stepping onto the shores of Tory Island takes you to a place you thought only existed in Irish folklore, a world where fact and fiction are confusingly intermingled. There are no rats on Tory Island. Uh, people have taken them out there, but uh, they died. And uh, in fact, people from the mainland get clay from Tory to ward off rats from their houses. But you just, you just can't go out and dig it up. You have to get it from a member of the Dugan family. And uh, he gives it to you in a small bag and 
you'll never see rats in your, about you for a, for a long time. <laughs> when the swirling mists and thick fog roll in from the open seas, an eerie stillness envelops the island. And in this strange atmosphere, it is not hard to see why mythology and superstition have such a strong hold in this place. The most powerful taboo belongs to a group of inscribed stones, known locally as cursing stones. Legend has it that if you were to turn the stones anti-clockwise from the sun, you could invoke a powerful curse on an enemy. They were used for hundreds of years, the cursing stones. They had one in Innistrahull and uh, probably Iron Moor and most of the inhabited islands around. So uh, there was something to be wary of. Living in such an insular community, the islanders are very wary of newcomers, especially unwelcomed ones. Rumour has it that in 1884, the cursing stones were used to ward off a government vessel, the HMS Wasp, that was reputedly coming to collect overdue rates. In a state of fear, the islanders sought the power of the cursing stones, desperate to prevent the wasp reaching the island shores. There was fine weather that day and the lieutenant knew the waters well, but tragically the ship never reached the island. Crashing on the rocks nearby, and losing almost all her crew. No one will ever know who or what was responsible for the accident, but shortly afterwards the cursing stones disappeared. It came from Mayo at the time, it was a British uh, naval ship, and it was uh, going around collecting rich. And uh, it ended up on the rocks on Tory, and uh, it was reputed that they turned the cursing stone on it. The Tory Islanders were very sorry for what they had supposedly done when they discovered that the ship was actually coming with uh, relief for them. So uh, they weren't pleased at all then. They were very sorry for the guys that went down with the ship and they tend the graveyard very well where the seamen are buried on the, on the island up near the lighthouse at the west end. The, the local priest then, he confiscated the stone and supposedly is buried in the local graveyard. But uh, who knows, maybe it'll be turned again someday. <laughs> who knows where the magical cursing stones have been buried? Perhaps they were thrown out to sea. Or maybe they lie on the shore no different now than all the other round pebbles on the beach. The last keeper has finally left bidding fond farewells to a way of life he will never see again, and the cold anonymity of mechanics have taken over the running of the lighthouse. The keeper stationed here was one of the few privileged outsiders to see the workings of the strange community, and the outside world will miss hearing the unusual tales. The empty rooms of the building echo with the haunting cries of gulls and intrusive winds whistle down corridors and rattle closed shutters. Keep away. Keep away. Outside, the gardens and animal enclosures have been reclaimed by nature, rambling weeds creeping over the retaining walls. But is the lighthouse really abandoned? Keep away. Keep away. In this mystical corner of Ireland, where it seems anything could happen and frequently does, it is no surprise to hear that visitors to this deserted place have heard whispering voices calling out to them, Keep away! Keep away! the locals believe the fairies and the phantoms of the island have finally been able to reclaim this barren corner. And they are determined to keep humans away for good.
The northeast coast of Ireland can easily seduce you with its tranquil beauty. A calm, serene location, its glistening waters running smoothly, small crests of white dancing across its surface. An idyllic place for the lighthouses they call the Maidens, it would appear. A picturesque spot for buildings that date back to the 1820s. The West Tower has long since gone to ruin, but the twin East Tower still stands proudly firm, a testament to the keepers and the families that lived here, and a still potent reminder that appearances can be deceptive. Bathed in sunshine, even the most treacherous of locations can take on a bewitching facade and hide the very real dangers that lie beneath the surface. Just a few miles off the mainland, even a normal day can uncover the rocks ready to rip the soul out of any vessel that dares to sail too close. The rough currents that seek to throw a crew into pearl and also illustrates the terrible isolation of those two tiny rocks, barely big enough to build a lighthouse, let alone be home to a family for months at a time. In Greek mythology, the sirens of old were reputed to have lured sailors to their destruction by their hypnotic uh, singing, and uh, over the uh, the years that, uh, I suppose, in the case of these rocks, became uh, uh, transformed into maidens rather than sirens. Just a few minutes on the East Tower is all that it takes to tell you about the isolation and claustrophobia. A few minutes because that is literally how long it takes to walk from one end of the island to the other. It was a bleak spot, really. There wasn't a, a, a blade of grass on, on the maidens, but a great place for fishing. Um, we fished until we got tired of catching fish, and uh, we used to pickle fish for the winter. We used to pickle a couple of barrels of fish, and it was you know, just, just a nice thing to, to have for the winter. And uh, we got tired of eating lobster, believe it or not. We used to do all kinds of things with them. We used to put them into omelettes, we used to have them in salads, we used to do, I don't know, anything that you can kind of think of, we, we really did. Yeah. Yet this never overlooked the main job for which the Twin Towers were built. The safety of the passing boats, a job which they did supremely well. Though that didn't prevent the steamer Princess Alexandra running aground in 1896, or such famous vessels as the transatlantic liner State of Louisa on Christmas Eve 1878 becoming victims. None was more unlikely, however, than the lighthouse tender the Grand Ual, a ship with all the latest navigational aids and officers and crew of unsurpassed knowledge of the reefs and currents along the coast. They had come out to check that the light was operating correctly and ended up demonstrating the very real dangers that exist. In 1903, the new light on the East Tower was rebuilt and improved, and it was at this point that the West Tower was discontinued. Only a few hundred yards away are the ruins of the West Tower, and it is from here that the most famous story of the Maidens emanates. It sparked off the most romantic and prevailing of love stories, a love story that overcame the isolated location and physical barriers to live forever in the annals of Irish lighthouse history. Two families lived out on the Maidens, the McKennas on the East Tower and the Redmonds on the West. And uh, he had uh, several daughters, including one called Marion, and she was uh, reputed to be the, the, the most uh, comely of all his daughters. And she fell in love with uh, a young man called Thomas McKenna, who uh, was in this rock. And uh, 
At that time, the families used to visit each other because there was a boat on the other rock. Uh, underneath the, the, the house, there's a, uh, there was a boat house, and the boat was kept there, and they were able to commute between the two rocks. However, the families fell out. The reason why has never been known. But from that day on, the fathers forbade their children from ever having contact again. The two lovers were virtual prisoners on their separate islands, and keeping in contact meant devising some ingenious methods. The most obvious saw Thomas actually building a boat and sailing across at night for a secret rendezvous, until his father found out and broke it into pieces. The next way saw them writing messages on the outside of buildings until that too was uncovered. The couple were by now becoming increasingly desperate. Tommy had the uh, sudden bright idea of using pigeons to carry messages between the two. At that time pigeons were used to carry messages between lighthouses and the shore. And, uh, by and by, uh, they grew tired of this arrangement. They, they, they yearned for something, uh, something uh, more uh, intimate, shall we say. And uh, they uh, resolved to, to uh, elope. Secretly building another flimsy vessel, Thomas ventured forth on the darkness of summer nights, navigating the perilous rocks and sailing across to pick up Mary Ann. In an ending to warm the hearts of even the most hardened cynic, the two young people sailed off into a lifetime of happiness together. In a way, it is a story that sums up the whole history of Irish lighthouses, romantic and yet dangerous people overcoming terrible hardships, living in some terrible conditions to see the glorious sunset at the end of the day that makes the country's coastlines such beautiful and spectacular places. The rolling hills and green pastures of the countryside around the city of Cork summarize all that is beautiful about the Irish landscape. Dotted among the patchwork fields are colour painted. At the time, uh, Roach's Point, they had a foghorn, and a lot of people were, were, were um, given out about the foghorn. They couldn't sleep at night, and uh, we always told them, well, uh, they had uh, beautiful music and uh, at enormous expense, and it was costing them nothing. So I think they laughed about it and, and uh, they took it. It had to go and that was it. It, it, it. The horn had to be blown when the fog was in to uh, um, a navigational aid as such and uh, we had to think of the mariner. Evoking such thoughts of beauty and tranquility, it is hard to believe the harmony of this place could ever be shattered. But on the peninsula near the lighthouse, the old watchtower now standing in ruins reflects the power of the elements. We should never forget that the lighthouse stands here for a reason, to protect ships from coming too close to the treacherous coastline of jagged rocks. The Simric was wrecked there. She ran ashore somewhere about 1908, I would imagine. And um, she was a total loss. She was a total loss. Uh, my aunt's husband was a keeper there at the time. And um, he said it was just terrible to see the vessel breaking up and uh, the doors and whatever floating by from the vessel, you know. And a magnificent ship, of course. But um, that's one of the dangers. That's why Roaches Point was there. Roaches Point is very treacherous. It is indeed. Uh, there's a liner lost uh, at Roaches Point and uh, several other fatalities there. 
So uh, it was a dangerous spot. For over 300 years, the Bailey, one of the oldest lighthouses in Ireland, has guided ships safely into the port of Dublin. It has provided a reassuringly prominent landmark for all those vessels with their precious cargoes headed for distant shores en route past Ireland's treacherous east coast. Since the 9th century, in the, the dark, formerly Hoth Summit, it was then only a primitive fire on a prominent rock, but it served its important purpose. The original lighthouse was up in the hill of Hoth, where the car park is now. It was built there in the 17th century. The present lighthouse was built here at the Bailey in the 14. There's been a lighthouse here since then. Last conditions and smog Dublin had that just had a lighthouse. The only thing I know that it was too high up and it should be cloud cover. So it was really too so down. More engineers build it near level. Approximately 120 feet. Our light is approximately 120 feet above sea. Some of the many disasters that have occurred in the waters near Dublin have sadly stemmed from a combination of the error of man and the ferociousness of nature. It was a very stormy winter night with very heavy snow falling and the master of the ship thought he, well he knew he was somewhere near the entrance to Dublin Bay but as he couldn't see the Bailey light he continued on the course he was on which brought him on the rocks very near there and the ship was lost. Anyway, the one at the Bailey was an old man over 70 who was so frail that he felt that he simply couldn't stand to go out into that gale and clean the lantern of the lighthouse. And it was completely snowed up and that's why the master of the ship didn't see it. On Christmas Eve in 1895, the beautiful Finnish frigate, the Palm, encountered a terrible storm which forced her toward Dublin Bay. Tossed around in mile-high seas and dangerously close to the rocks, the crew signalled for help. Lifeboats were immediately launched, but so perilous were the conditions that one of them capsized, losing her entire crew. The rescue attempt was then abandoned. Several days later, when the storm had relented, the Palm's stranded crew could finally be rescued. This was the greatest loss in lifeboat history. Their small wooden lifeboat was washed ashore days later. Very sad thing, because 15 lifeboat men lost their lives, and such is the sense of belonging in the lifeboat community in this area as it is in other similar areas with the lifeboat that members of the families of those crews actually continued to work at sea in the same way ready to go out and risk their lives unpaid, just like those 15 dead men did. Keepers either loved or hated life at the Bailey. Some wanted the isolation appropriate to the job, and others relished the chance to be stationed near civilization. Whatever their feelings, every keeper started their career here. We'd arrive here at the Bailey, you did, you did a, an exam down in Dunleary and if you passed that, you arrived, you were sent to the Bailey here. And from here then you'd be three years here. 
going to the different stations around the coast. So you'd be learning, every, every station was different. So you'd be, the more stations I went to, the more experience you got of, of the different lighthouses around the coast. First thing in the morning, you'd have six, maybe eight lads in here. And each fella, most of the time, each fella cook for himself. But the odd time, fella do a special. And there were some rare concoctions made up, especially at dinner time. I remember the days, fellas making pancakes. And there was pancakes all over the floor, trying to flip them. And uh, again, there was the odd argument in here. <coughs> And the, the odd egg thrown, it was often the odd egg smashed over a fella's head, but again, all in good jest. The Bailey was the last Irish lighthouse to close, and for the keepers, it was an emotional time. Having devoted many years of their lives to often isolated rocks, it was hard for them to tear themselves away from a truly unique way of life. Slowly but surely they are coming to accept the finality of automation, although a sense of grief still hangs in the air when they recount fond memories. We were the last to be actually trained here and moved out on the coast. So you knew that the end, the end was nigh, it was, it was arriving slowly but surely and that we were given the final time, March 97, the final station. The Bailey here would close and it would be the end of the air altogether. So you knew it was coming, but you had prior warning to a degree, so it, it helped. A very, a very sad occasion, as I say, I, I was 13 years in the service from 1980 to 1993. And I'm glad to have been part of the service and to have met the people I've have met through the years and to have seen the places, some of the rocks and all that not everyone will ever get the chance to see. Very few people in fact. And it was it's great to have the memories of those places. And I've I've a number of photographs and the memorabilia of certain rocks that I was on. And it'll stick with me forever. It was a great time I had and but a sad, again as I say a very sad day that came to an end. Now all the lighthouses around Ireland are operated from one office and a complex network of computers automatically works the many lights and foghorns when needed. Many are saddened by the loss of the keeper. He noted the migration of birds and monitored the local wildlife, warned locals of incoming storms and most importantly stationed out on a solitary rock the keeper was the mariner's friend, constantly on the lookout for ships in trouble. Well, there, there was a sadness about it, a great sadness about it. There was sadness anywhere, everywhere you'd speak, you know, they say, gosh, it's awful, isn't it, you know, but then what that followed was, well, that's automation and that's technology and progress and there's not much you can do about it, you know. And anyway, ships now have all this satellite navigation and all that, and they don't really need the lighthouses, you know, they don't really depend on them. They're well out to see yachts the same have the satellite navigation. So, uh, but I think of all that, if they didn't have, if any of that broke down or anything, they could be looking for a lighthouse, you know. I suppose quite a lot of people owe their lives, and certainly scores and scores of people, low, uh, own, owe their comfort and um, relief of anxiety to the watchfulness of lighthouse keeper. Just the local boats, people that buy boats in the summertime and uh, they, they visit the, the sea maybe for a, a day tour and they, they get they're inspired to buy a wee boat and they buy a wee boat and then they head out for sea and the wind ch changes and the sea gets rough and uh, they, they find maybe their engine breakdown and they have no rowers or they have no way of communicating with anyone, so 
uh, just those people that we always looked after. And we always expected that to happen, in, uh, you know, when, when those pleasure boats were around in the summertime around like us. We always kept a close eye on them to make sure they always got home safely. I'm sorry because my father, my grandfather and my brother and uncles and aunts and everybody were... It was a great family thing for us, but it's, alas, it is gone, yeah. Perhaps the rocks could have gone in the headland stations today. It's, it's just hard to know. Um, the places lend themselves to weather monitoring and to Coast Guard type um, duties or to, you know, it's just hard to know what way it could have, uh, what way it could have, it could have gone. It, it's an era gone. The era might have gone, but the memories, the myths, the stories and the legends will always remain. They will live on for as long as the lighthouses stand proudly as guardians for the boats that sail around the coastline of Ireland.